Yep, it's all good. <clears throat> Excellent. So uh, we are recording right now. Um, if you have any questions in class here, go ahead and ask those questions because it's easier for me to address the question right away when you, you know, have those you know, items in your head. Um, I did finish grading exam one, okay? I do not have it with me. I have one more to grade today and then I'll be done with you know, this particular class. I do have to kind of nag again, you know, the importance of definitions because from the answers of quite a few of the submissions, I think there are some people who did not, you know, understand or know the definitions. Um, and I just cannot overemphasize you know, how that will continue to be important in this class, as well as in probably all of your classes, okay? Most of the STEM classes, you know, knowing your definitions is really important. So I just want to kind of use this opportunity to talk about that just a little bit. All right, so a little bit of a heads up for next week. So next Monday, I will be, uh, I won't be here. And you probably don't want, don't need to be here, but if you want to kind of show up here and do your work here, that's fine too. But it's going to be remote asynchronous on next Monday because I have to go to a funeral. And then it'll be again asynchronous remote on next Wednesday because I have, I'm on a panel for interviews. So for two different reasons, we're gonna miss your two actual in-person lectures. All right, so you can do this at home. I will provide a video recording about the same length as a usual class um, so that you guys can watch it. Um, there will be lab assignments, but I will give you like a longer time to do your lab because you know since I won't be here walking around to kind of address questions, so I'll give you more time for the lab component. But there's no need to show up, you know, um, on <clears throat> next Wednesday or next Monday. Do we have any questions about next Monday or Wednesday? It's going to be remote. I will have a recording. It's going to be asynchronous, which means you, know, you don't have to watch the recording at exactly this time. You can watch it anytime during the day, but the lab will be due at the end of the day. Yes? Uh, does, does it apply to the video before the class? Say that one time? Does it yes. Apply to Maybe. I, I'm not sure yet because on Monday, um, the uh, funerals you know, should be all done by the time we have the uh, 440 class. So I'm not sure about the 440 class. I, I have to kind of plan a little bit for that too. For Wednesday, the answer is yes. For the 440 class will also be remote and asynchronous. Okay, that's a good question, thank you. But since you know, not a whole lot of people here are also in 440, I just you know, decided not to talk about it until we get to 440. All right, so with that said and done, we are going to look into a new homework assignment. So the new homework assignment is called negative exponent and the description is all here, okay? So I'll go ahead and just kind of do a quick preview of the homework assignment. There's no access code for this one because it is a programming assignment. Um, I think all of you should be able to do it because you know, this class has a prerequisite of CISP 360 and this particular project only involves writing a single function in, in C or C++. So there we go. I'm going to go over you know, the code a little bit. <clears throat> so when you open it up, you don't have to open it now. In fact, I would not recommend it because I would like you to kind of focus on the way that I talk about this and ask questions when you are not sure what I mean by something. <clears throat> so there's a single file you know, that you need to download. So I'm just going to right click and then click save link as. So I can download the file to my you know, uh, local uh, machine. It's called monolith.c. Okay, so I'm going to replace the one that I already have with this file. And then I'll go ahead and switch to the command line tool so that you can take a look at you know, the content of the file. All right, so let me switch to a command line interface that you can see. Give me a second here. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so this file is called monolith.c because it's a monolithic uh, source file, which means you know, normally I usually break a source file into multiple pieces, 
but this time I just use one single file. Um, so depending on what platform you're familiar with to write your C or C++ programs, you can use whatever tool you want to, okay? But the bottom line is whatever source code you submit has to be compilable in GCC. Okay, and GCC is basically the back end of code blocks. Um, I, I suspect the VS Code may also be able to use GCC as a back end. So that way, you know, all you have to do is to make sure whatever uh, platform you use to develop the program, it is GCC compatible. Um, I believe uh, Replit is GCC based. <clears throat> code blocks is definitely GCC based. GCC itself is GCC based, right? <clears throat> Um, and then the best resource I have here, or the best resource for doing this kind of, this kind of homework assignment, especially for those of you who don't want to mess around with you know, the command line stuff unless you really have to, is um, <clears throat> a link here. It's called uh, Online GDB. So if you go to Online GDB, it is a, it's a website, okay? It's a web page, but it also gives you all everything that you need in order to write programs in C++, C++ and also a whole bunch of other languages. So in this case, I would just pick you know, the regular program, programming language C uh, without anything. So the way you do this is you go to the editing part here, you select all, and then you uh, copy and paste. Okay, you can delete everything here first. Go back to the editor, well, let me see where am I, right here. Control A, select all, you can do the same thing with, a, with Notepad in Windows. Control C to copy, switch back to the web, interface and then make sure your blinky cursor is here control V to paste the entire thing in and on top of that you have to select your programming language to be just regular C okay I just use C because you know I don't use C in C out for debugging and nor do I recommend the, that particular way of debugging programs but each of to our own okay if you're used to C out and just want to print stuff out when you're debugging go for it Okay, but there are better tools available even within online GDB. <clears throat> so with online GDB, you can sign in first. Okay, so there's a page you can sign in. There's no membership whatsoever. You just have to sign in with your usual Gmail you know, identity. If you don't want to give out your, your normal personal Gmail identity, you just sign up for another Gmail account just for this. Okay, you know, I don't think there's anything coming from here, but if you want to be sure, you can always sign up for you know, a you know, fake account or another account so that you, can, you don't get bothered by all the spam messages. <clears throat> but once you sign in, you can save. So once you have selected your programming language and you paste it in the program here, you can click save and then you can just name your project. So this way your entire program is online. It is in the cloud, which means uh, as long as you remember to click the save button, um, you don't have to worry about losing your program because it's already in the cloud. I have not lost a single project you know, since I have been using online GDB. So I'm just gonna call this one you know, negative exponent. <clears throat> and you can even change your destination, you know, but I'm just gonna keep the default of my projects. So now the project is saved. Do we have any questions at this point of using online GDB? When you're all done with your program, when you need to submit it, you have to kind of you know, put all of this back into a file before you turn it in. So click on this button here to download your program, save it to a file, and then upload that file through um, Canvas, and that's how you're gonna turn in your program. <clears throat> so are we good so far? Yep, go ahead. You can use, do you mean switching between C and C++? Yeah, you can use C++ if you want to. Uh, this The source code is compatible with C++. So for those of you who want to use C++ because you, you think you want to use C out or C in or anything that is specific to C++, you can switch to C++. I don't think, okay, you need to specify which version of C++. Uh, do not use Turbo C because you know, that's a really old <clears throat> compiler, but it has certain features that require, um, you know, like a special treatment. So I personally just use C, but you can certainly use C++. Any other questions? OK, 
Okay, if there, if there are no questions, I will show you the general layout of the program. This is main. So what main does is you know, it process you know, what we call the command line um, options. <clears throat> you don't have to worry about that. Okay, there's nothing here that you need to worry about or change. Okay, so do not touch any code until I get to the part where you know, your code is supposed to go into. The subroutine that you will be completing is called E10 to E2, which is you know, the exponent of 10 to the exponent of 2. <clears throat> it is right after a call to parse. So all that regular expression stuff that we talked about in this class is already done in parse. Okay, so I wrote all the parsing stuff already, which is a whole bunch of code up here. So you can see this is the entry point of parse. It calls, you know, it calls a function that will parse the sign and so on and so forth. So if you want to look into that, that's cool, okay, but you don't have to, okay? So only read into this part if you think, okay, I'm just kind of curious of how all of this stuff is done. Okay, go in and take a look, but you don't have to do anything there. You can focus on just the subroutine that you need to write, which is uh, E2, E10 to E2. So the entry point of the subroutine is somewhere right here. So this is the only subroutine that you have to write. Okay, do not touch the rest of the program. Okay, because if you uh, change anything, you know, the program may not work the way that my um, grading script is expecting, and as a result, you know, that can cause problems. All right, so are we good so far in terms of just kind of navigating to the subroutine that you need to write? Okay, so now we switch back to the description of the assignment because we want to take a look at, so what are, what are you supposed to do? So right here. All right, so <clears throat> your program is going to take a look at a structure, you know, that is passed as a pointer to a structure. Um, and what we want to do is to preserve the value being represented, okay? So that's the objective of your code, but it has to follow these particular constraints as well. So V is a value that is represented by C being a coefficient times two to the power of E2 times 10 to the power of E10. So the V is the value that you want to preserve. With the following, with the following restrictions, the resulting coefficient should make the condition two times C should be greater than two to the power of 64, two to the power of 64 minus one true. In other words, I want the coefficient to fill up all 64 bits of an unsigned 64 bit integer. So it, does, it should not be small, okay? It should be like a gigantic number using all 64 bits of the coefficient. I'll show you the type in just a little bit. When your algorithm is done, E10, which, is, which has the name of E10 also in the structure, should be zero when your algorithm is done because you know, we are trying to bump the negative exponent of 10 all the way to zero. E2 can be any integer, so it can be positive or negative because the idea is we want to change E10, which is the exponent of 10, so that, and also C, and by changing you know, that and also E2, we want to preserve the same value. <clears throat> the representative V should be preserved as much as possible. So that means your know, biased error should not be there. There should be a rounding of some kind. Your entire program should not use anything that relies on float double or functions from the math uh, header file. So that means you know, no call to power, no call to log. Uh, you cannot use float, you cannot use double and so on. You can only use integer arithmetics. So you can use integer division, multiplication, subtraction, addition, comparison, and so on, but no floats whatsoever, not even constants. All right, and I want people to comment their code as well, okay? So the, you know, anyone who's turning in a program that has no comment will get a certain amount of deduction. <clears throat> so are we good so far with the description? Does everybody understand the objective of this code here? Okay, so maybe not entirely. So what I'll do is I will give you an example. So let me, oh, okay, I keep switching using the uh, that method, which is not what I want. All right, so I'm also demonstrating how to use online GDB right now, so you might want to jot down the time frame because if you need to come back here, if you want to use online GDB as your tool, you might want to get back to this time, which is 1045. All right, so the first thing is, um, how to set up a breakpoint. 
You can set up a breakpoint pretty easily just by clicking next to the line where you want the program to pause when execution reaches that point. Does everybody understand what the, what the breakpoint is or the concept of a debugger in this class? Because if not, I can explain that a little bit. So is it safe for me to assume that you all understand what a debugger is and what is a breakpoint in the context of a debugger? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm not so sure. You're not so sure. Okay, that's fine. So a debugger is a tool that can help you control the execution of a program, and most importantly, it can stop at a certain point of the program, or I should say pause at a certain point of the program, so that at that point you can examine variables, which can really help you debug a program, okay? So right now I'm showing you, you know, how to set up what we call a breakpoint, which means execution will pause when it gets to that point, okay? So, <clears throat> so to debug a program using online GDB, you click on debug here, which you can also use your function keys for, which is F8. I just you know, click on the button because it's pretty easy to do. Okay, so now you know, the bottom part of your screen, you can drag it up a little bit, and I'm using um, a 1280 by 720 resolution here. So when you're using a regular computer screen, you will see a lot more, okay? But right now, since I'm using a much lower resolution screen, um, you know, things are, you know, little bit too blown up, blown up and I cannot show you a lot of text. So right here, uh, it, it's confirming that we have a breakpoint already set up, but the program hasn't started to run yet. To run the program, it's not just running it, you have to type R, which is the abbreviation of run, for those of you who like to spell the entire thing, run works as well. And then you have to type your dash N, which is a switch, a command line switch, to tell the program what follows is a number to be converted, okay? And then you give it a number in base 10 scientific notation, like 1.23 times 10 to the power of negative 45. So this is a really kind of useful example because later on I'll also give you a log file to kind of tell you how the coefficient and the exponent of 2 as well as the exponent of 10 should be changed as the program progresses. So this is a particularly useful example. Okay, so you press the enter key, okay? and it will get to the breakpoint. The, the way you know that it's at a breakpoint, there are two things. One is on the command line itself, it says right here, breakpoint one, blah, 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 on line 126. So that's a confirmation that the program has reached a breakpoint, a breakpoint, and it has paused its execution. I said paused, not stopped, okay? Because stopped means there's no, no way to resume, but with pausing, you can resume the execution of the program at this point. <clears throat> so the nice thing is, when it pauses at a execution at a, on a certain line, now you can examine things. For instance, you can say, okay, there's a single parameter called PN here in this particular subroutine. What is it? Tell me what. Tell me about it. So what it's telling you right now is it is a pointer to a structure and the address is you know, in dark blue, which most of you cannot read. That's okay, we, are, we don't really care about the address. But we do care what is at the address, which is a structure. So you can say print asterisk pn, and now it shows you, I know this is still a little bit hard to read, but it tells you that the sign, this is s, the sign is a zero, the coefficient, which is coef, is 123, the E10, which is the exponent of 10, is negative 47, and then the exponent of 2 is 0. So in other words, this particular program does all the parsing for you already, and it converts the coefficient into a integer or unsigned integer automatically for you, adjusting the exponent of 10 along the way. This is your starting point. Are we doing okay so far with this program? So what your program needs to do is to change the coefficient, change E10, and change E2 so that the value represented here is preserved. What value are we talking about? 123 times 10 to the power of negative 47 should be the value being represented when you're all done with this code here. Are we still doing okay so far with understanding what the program is supposed to do? All right, excellent. 
So there are a few things that might be helpful. Okay, so I'm going to change the program. So one thing that is not so nice about your know, online GDB is if you don't do a don't do something for a while, it will time out. Now when it times out, it doesn't delete your program, so you're, you're not going to lose your code, but you lose your debug session. Okay, which is cumbersome. Okay, you know sometimes you know, because you're kind of halfway done debugging the program, and now it's you know it's resetting itself, so you have to start the whole debugging session again. <clears throat> Are we still doing okay so far with the description of how to use online GDB? Now, everything that you can do online with online GDB, you can also do it in code blocks. So that's another alternative is to use code blocks. You can also use you know, just regular GCC on a command line interface uh, environment. You can do it in Windows. You can do it in Linux. You know, there's a whole variety of ways to write a C program. Are we still doing okay so far? All right, okay. So I am going to give you a few tips of how to debug a program. So I'm gonna stop the execution of the program because as long as the program is in execution, it won't let you edit the file. So you want, you want to stop it first before you make any changes to the program. So now I can make some changes here. So what I'll do is I'm gonna do something that is definitely wrong, okay? And you probably don't want to do it the way that I'm doing it here because I'm just illustrating a few points of how to use the debugger. So I'm going to say it's an infinite loop. <clears throat> and the only thing the infinite loop is going to do is to increment E10, which is a member of uh, the structure that is pointed to by uh, PN. So this will work, okay? So for those of you who are looking at this particular syntax and go like, I don't remember what that means. It's time to review your C and C++ concepts, okay? Because this should have been taught in CISP 360. If, you, if it is not in C, taught in CISP 360, let me know, okay? You don't have to do it in the class because I would have to have a conversation with whomever was teaching CISP 360 when you took it. Is that okay? And I won't name your name. I won't say, you know, Oh, you know, Joe just told me that you did not teach your pointers and structures when you're in your class. I would only bring it up as a conversational topic with that person. But that conversation will have to happen if, the, if you were not taught how to use uh, pointers and also structures in that class. All right? Okay? So, obviously, this program is not you know, going to work the way it's supposed to. So, if I run this code, okay, we'll find out what happens. So do not use run, okay, because the program has no output whatsoever. So when you type run, even if your program is 100% is correct, there's no output whatsoever. So I would just use debug to make sure that you can test the program to make sure that it works the way it's supposed to. All right, so there we go. We have the same breakpoint. And this time I'm going to delete the breakpoint. So to remove a breakpoint is just to toggle it which means you're clicking on a red circle again, it's going to remove the breakpoint like this. Okay, so now the breakpoint is gone, and I'll run the program the same way, R, and then a dash N, 1.23 E, negative 45. When you're debugging a program like this one, it is helpful to use the same test case every single time to debug it. Okay, because this way you know what the behavior is supposed to be, because I will give you the log file that represents you know, what the program is supposed to do. And then each time you're using the same test case so you can compare what happens in one particular instance versus the next. All right, so I'm gonna run the program here and it is not coming back. Why? Why do you think this program is not pausing at all? Why is it not finishing? Go ahead. It goes on forever because while one is one way to write an infinite loop. Because the condition inside the while or after the while specifies, okay, if this condition is true, I stay in the loop. When do you think one is going to become false? Never, exactly. So that means you know, this is an infinite loop, the program is not going to end. And I suspect many of you, okay, in your first attempt to write this code, Will, end, will encounter infinite loops. So how do you fix an infinite loop? First thing, Control-C, okay? Type Control-C, it will pause the execution. 
In fact, it will tell you exactly where it is. So we know that line 128 is at least a part of the infinite loop. Okay? That is going to be helpful because when you, if you have multiple loops and the program is not coming back, you don't even know which loop it is in, which loop is infinite. This will at least tell you which loop is in. So when you're here, there are a few things you can do. <clears throat> you can say print. Okay. Come on. Print. Okay, there we go. And you can print various things. So in this case, it looks like the member E10 is particularly important. So I can print the value of E10 as a member of the structure the PN is pointing to. Okay? That can be helpful. But you may say, um, but then I'm not really sure why it is stuck in the infinite loop because it really should exit. I want to know the path of the program, okay, where it's going. There are two ways to do it. You can use step over or you can step use step into. From the context of this code, it makes no difference because you are not writing another subroutine that your code is going to call. So step over versus step into would do exactly the same thing. I would recommend using just step over. Step into will, step, will basically uh, pause execution when you get into the entry point of a subroutine that you're calling. Step over will execute the subroutine and then pause after the subroutine is all done. Okay, so that's the difference between these two. You can also use the commit, <coughs> excuse me. You can also use just the commit line commit, which is, which is step. <coughs> And it will just do a single step. <clears throat> and because this is an infinite loop, it doesn't actually <clears throat> give me a chance to step. So I have to do control C again to break the execution. All right, so this is all good. But if you look at the, the log file, okay, let me show you what the log file is gonna look like. So I go back here and um, I don't need this mouse pad anymore. Instead, I need to use mouse pad on the log, and I cannot even remember the name of the log. Let me go back to the assignment because I want to show you where you can find the log file. The log file is all the way down here. It is analogous to the log file in your um, logic theme, your homework assignments. This basically describes you know, what the program should do. So what we'll do is we're gonna, we're gonna save link as again, and it's called sample-1.log. I'm gonna rewrite, overwrite the existing one. So go back to the command line. I mean, you don't have to go to the command line. Uh, it's called sample1-1.log. So this is the content of the file. It describes how the coefficient, the exponent of two, and also the exponent of 10 are being changed. And you can see that, oh, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff going on here, but it doesn't change E10 until much later, right about here, okay? So you can see how E2 is decremented all the way to negative 57. Then we change E10 from negative 47 to negative 46. And you can also see how the coefficient got changed in the process. So this is how you know whether your program is working correctly, because if the way that the, the coefficient E2 and E10 is being changed is different in your code than here, then you probably have a, you, know, you ha probably have to fix something in your code. Question? No? Okay. So, <clears throat> so now the question is, if I go back to the debugger, okay, in uh, online GDB, what am I supposed to do, you know, to go through uh, like 50 something iterations, okay? I want to stop, I want to pause the program, but only when blah, blah, blah equals to blah, blah, okay? So there's a way to set up a conditional breakpoint, yeah? Related, but I just want to make sure, are you recording? That's a very good idea to double check, okay? And I will make sure that we are indeed recording. The screen is good, the audio is good as well. So thank you. Thank you for the reminder. All right, so getting back here. All right, so you can set up what we call a conditional breakpoint, and the way to do it, now this is a slightly more advanced you know, concept, but I think it's gonna be helpful. So you basically say condition, like so, and then you have to name the breakpoint itself. I don't have a breakpoint break right now, so I have to put a breakpoint in the program first. And once again, you can either put a breakpoint here by clicking, or you can just say B, you know, which stands for breakpoint, and then give it a line number, which is 128 in this case. 
and this will be, be my breakpoint. Now, this time it is important to note the number of the breakpoint. This is breakpoint two, because that's also the identifier of this particular breakpoint. So now I can use condition. So condition is basically setting up a condition associated with a breakpoint so that the breakpoint will not pause unless the condition itself is true. So now I have to say condition two, okay, which is identifying which breakpoint the condition applies to. And I can now specify just about any um, condition that I can you know, specify here. So in this case, you know, I'm going to say I will break if PN points to uh, E10 equals to, I don't know, 45, okay? Which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever in this context. I'm just using this to illustrate what you can do. Okay, press the enter key. So now the breakpoint is a conditional breakpoint, which basically means as long as E10 of the structure that PN is pointing to is not 45, it will just keep going. You don't have to keep pressing next, 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 or step, 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 because it will just only stop when it is 45. Do we have any questions right now? Okay. So now I can do a continue, okay, which means it'll run the program at full speed until a breakpoint is activated. Okay, so that's continue, which also you can use the button here. Continue would do exactly the same thing. I'm just much more familiar with the command line stuff here, you know, so I just usually just type the command here. So now it goes, keeps going. <clears throat> and hopefully at this at some point it's gonna stop. I'm not really sure when. And if it doesn't stop, you can always pause the execution just to kind of check on it. So I want to check on E10. It is not changed. It is still negative 70. Was it that value before? Uh, nope. And, well, okay. So we'll go, go ahead and continue again. There we go. Eventually, it will circle back to you know, the, 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 the value 45. So now if I print again, you can also use the up arrow key to repeat the previous command, and now it is 45, okay? So this is a rather useful debugging technique because if you know that you're not supposed to get out of a loop until blah, 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 you don't want to have to type step, 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 step all the time until it gets out. You can just set up a conditional breakpoint and go like, don't bother me until this condition is met, okay? So it's a pretty useful feature. Um, and I think that's about all the tricks that I need to show you for this particular program. All right, let's go back to um, <clears throat> this particular view here. So what you can see here, okay, you're right, this is the last value of the coefficient before a division by 10 that is rounded. How do we know? Count the number of digits in base 10, okay? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So there are 20 digits. Okay, is that right? Did I miscount? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there are 20 digits. This is the largest number you can represent in a 64-bit unsigned integer before, if you double again, okay, it becomes too large to be represented. So that is when we perform a division by 10 that is rounded. How do we know that division is rounded? See how the coefficient ended with 5, 6 here? After the division, after the integer division of by 10, it should end up with a 2, 5, but it's a 2, 6 here. It is a rounding uh, effect. But you don't have to do rounding by calling round, which is in the math library. We, in this class, we already talked about how to do rounding by doing a certain trick with integer arithmetics. Okay, so if you're not quite remembering how to do it, I would suggest you to go back to the notes. So all the uh, topics here has to do with floating point calculation. And if I go to a specific module, 
it would be the floating point module at section 5.2.1. Okay, so let me go back to the module. So this way I can point out to you where all this stuff is. So we go back here, open a new tab, and then we go to section 5.2.1. So 5.2.1 is you know, what you do, do when the exponent of 10 is initially less than zero. So here I'm giving you the, a description of the logic, but this description of logic may not make any sense unless you understand you know, all the other stuff that is preceding section 5.2.1. So reading just section 5.2.1 in an isolated way is not going to be helpful. Okay, you really want to read pretty much from the beginning, okay, you know, and understand all the material up to section 5.2.1 in order to really understand what is going on, what is it specifying, and how do we get this done. Are we doing okay so far in terms of knowing where to find the material, where to, you know, what resource you can use to, you know, kind of write the program, um, what kind of tools you can use to debug the program, and also finding out, you know, the theoretical stuff that is behind the calculations. This is a culmination of everything that we have talked about so far with scientific notation and the floating point number representation. So that's kind of you know, where we are sitting here in this particular case. So I'm gonna pause a little bit here, okay? I'm at a break point myself to see if you guys have any questions. So inquire away. No questions. Yep. Is this due on the 16th? This is due on the 16th, which is next Monday. So you have one week to work on it. But I can tell you, this is, okay, it depends on the person. I have seen people staying after class, you know, you know, and get this done like in an hour. Okay, I've seen that. I've also seen people trying to get this done, you know, starting on Sunday, and you know, um, there was there were a few semester when I taught this taught this class online, and I had a Discord server, and I was getting pinged, like on the in on the Monday morning before it was due at two a.m., three a.m., and so on, because people were trying to get it done within hours of the due date. I would I would strongly suggest not to do it. Any other questions? Any questions about how to read or produce the uh, the log file? The log file you cannot really produce. Okay, I can answer that question right away. Is you cannot really produce the the log file because the log file itself is um, I use I had to use C out or print up statements to produce the, the the log file. So the way you basically look at the log file is not really to um, oh there's one more thing that you might be interested in. Okay. So let me, let me show you what I mean by that. So in addition to breakpoints, there is such a thing called a watch statement. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate that concept now. The time is uh, 11.08. Okay, so if you want to kind of jot down the time and also the topic, I'm going to talk about um, what a watch expression is. And um, so you can kind of take a look at that. So I want to debug the program again, this time without a single breakpoint. All right, so before I run the program, I'm going to set up a break, uh, well, I have to set up a breakpoint somewhere here first. So I'm gonna do it at the entry point of the subroutine or at least in here. Now you will realize that there are certain points you cannot put a breakpoint, like you know, the red dot would not appear. So this is the only place and also here, these are the only two places. Oh, it won't even let me do it. So now I can run the program. Remember dash and 1.23 E negative 45. And now we are here. Um, hmm. I do not remember setting a breakpoint at main. That's okay. All right, so now we're here. I will remove this breakpoint here. And instead, I'm gonna say watch. So a watch point or a watch expression is an expression that the debugger is monitoring. If the expression changes its value, 
it will pause execution and show you how it got changed. Okay, it can be useful, but it can also give you a lot of stuff that you really do not need. Okay, so it's up to you to decide when is a good time to use it. So if I say watch, okay, and I say watch how the you know, E10 of P of the structure the PN is pointing to is changing. Okay, so now we have a you know, quote unquote hardware you know, watch point. And if I continue with the program, okay, see I don't have a breakpoint here. So I say continue, which means run the program at full speed. Okay, do not pause anywhere unless there's a reason to. So if I click that, okay, it will basically pause, pause almost right away because upon the increment of the E10 member of the structure the PN is pointing to, it reports back right away and say the old value of that expression used to be negative 47 and it is now negative 46. You can watch anything, okay? You don't even have to watch something that is a, a member of a structure that a point is pointing to. You can watch a condition if you want to, okay? What condition are we talking about? You can now say, okay, we can remove a watch point. I'm not really sure how to remove a watch point, but that's okay because there's built-in help to a GDB. You just say help watch, which explains you know, how to make a watch point. And if I want to delete a watch point, I have to learn how to delete it. So I'm going to say help delete. And it says here, you can, you can delete you can delete the breakpoint and checkpoint, trace point, and T variable. Uh, or you can also ask you know, Google, okay, GDB delete watch. And the first link should be applicable. All right. So delete. Okay, so it is. It really is the same numbering system. So you just say delete and then follow by the watch point number. So let me switch back to the debugger and go back to the watch point that I just set up. So the watch point is watch point six. So I just have to say delete six, and that removes the watch point. Okay. So as I said a little bit earlier, you can watch any expression. So that means you can say something like this. You can say watch um, PN points to E10 is equal to you know 50. Okay, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm just using a particular one, and you can make it complex too. You can say and uh, PN points to E2 is a zero, and so on and so forth. So press the enter key, and then I can continue execution. So right now, you know, the it's still watching. Hmm. Oh, okay. So right now it is saying the old value of this entire expression was a zero because it was false, and now it is true. So the change from zero to one is not referring to E10 or E2 because those are members of the structure that the PN is pointing to. The change from zero to one refers to the entire Boolean expression, which is the conjunction itself. So this feature can be extremely useful when you're debugging this program because you can set, you can basically specify, I am expecting that blah, blah, blah is going to be blah, blah, blah at some point of time. I don't want to keep pressing the continue or the step button you know, myself until it gets to that point. You just set up a watch point and let the program run and it will basically pause execution when it gets to that point. Is that okay? And when it does get to that point, okay, like right now, the program has paused its execution, which means you can use print to examine stuff. Now, print is not limited to do something that is really simple like this, because you can also say, uh, what about this times 10? Now, that has no particular meaning in this context, but you can use any expression. So that can be quite helpful when you are debugging your program. Are we doing okay so far with this code here? Okay. Um, for those of you who really want to learn even more about using GDB, you can also learn how to change the value of something in your program. So you can say set var. In this case, you know, I can say, okay, I know the program did something wrong, 
and change E10 to something that's not supposed to be, I can reset it like this. So I can reset the value of a variable or anything that the program has access to. So you're basically resetting the condition of the variables back to a different point so that you, your pro, you can continue to debug the program knowing that it made a mistake earlier, but you can continue with the rest of the execution of the program. Are we doing okay so far? Any questions? I'm gonna give you guys plenty of time to think about any question that you might have at this point. No questions, okay. All right, so if anyone wants to learn more about how to use your GDB, all you have to do is to just you know, type for a tutorial how to use GDB, okay? Just, this is how to find it. Um, <clears throat> and you will find that a lot of universities, four-year universities, uh, have tutorials of some kind of how to use a GDB. So you can also, you know, you can basically read some of those uh, documentation or tutorial of how to use the basic features of GDB. If not, most of the things that pe most people want to do can be done using these buttons, um, but I am you know, kind of more familiar with GDB, so I can show you all the kind of more advanced you know, uh, concepts in debugging. All right, any questions? Any questions about how to get started with this project? Any questions? This is not going to be a group project. I do not do group projects in my classes. So this is an individual project. I want people to work on this individually. Um, and when, when I read the comments, I typically can tell whether you know, it's a joint effort or not. Um, but the reason why you know, this is going to be an individual project is um, I find that in, in group projects, it's beneficial when everybody is chipping in but unfortunately, in you know, many teams, uh, a lot of times you know, one person is doing all the work and then the other four are basically watching that one person doing all the work. So um, that may not be the best way for me to assign grades. Are we doing okay so far with this homework assignment? Okay, all right. So this is due in a week and um, that's uh, where we are going to, you, you might want to schedule, you know, your time, okay, you know, when to get started with this one, um, because you know, it might take you a little bit of time to get it done. All righty. So any questions? No questions? Okay. All right. If there are no questions, yes. Is it separate from... I believe so, but let me check. It's possible that I forgot to make it visible. Oh, it is? Oh, it says it's published. Okay. So it's published and it is due at exactly 10.30 next Monday. So you got about a week to do it. Um, Negative exponent. Mm -hmm. Yep. All righty. And I can also tell you, you know, this particular homework assignment may be helpful to get a reasonable score in exam two because I guarantee there will be a question on floating point number calculations in exam two. So you know, understanding how it works you know, at this point here can be helpful you know, understanding the concept so that, you know, by the time we get to exam two, you go like, hmm, okay, I get it. I can do it using a program, but for simple stuff, I can do it by hand as well. All right. So with this already said, then we are going to move on to the next topic. And we are moving on to the von Neumann, von Neumann architecture. Have we started on von Neumann architecture in this class? I don't think so, okay. So we're gonna get started with von Neumann architecture, which is an entire different module. So this one talks about the von Neumann architecture and memory. 
So the first thing is to talk about, you know, who's von Neumann here? Why is he important? How many people have heard of von Neumann prior to this class? Okay, in what context? Um, in physics. In physics? Okay. So von Neumann is one of those people where you know, we call him a polymath. So what is a polymath? Someone who studies a lot of different topics or is good at a lot of different yep. subjects. Yep. Exactly. So he is a jack of all trade, but master of everything. Because you know the phrase usually goes jack of all trade, master of none. But he is quite the opposite of that. So I'm gonna go to the Wikipedia page and you know just get, get a quick introduction to you know this person. <clears throat> so he made major contributions. It's not just like you know he can carry on a conversation with you know, people who understand mathematics, physics, economics, computing, and so on and so forth. He is a master of everything you know, that he touches. Um, if you ask you know, his peers at the time when he was still alive, of, you know, so what do you think of you know, John von Neumann? They will all say, he's a genius, okay? <laughs> he's one of those people. He also overlaps his time with um, Albert Einstein. Uh, I believe they overlapped when Albert Einstein was teaching at Princeton University, uh, they were along the same hallway. And he is, I think he is a very extroverted person. He likes to listen to loud polka music. And Albert Einstein is really quite the introvert who prefers to work in a quiet environment with nobody bothering him. So you can kind of imagine the conversations they might have along the hallway. It's like, can you please turn down your music a little bit? I'm trying to think here. Mm, but I like my music. Just deal with it. So, anyway, interesting person. He passed away at an early age. Okay, so if you look at his, um, you know, how long he's, he passed away. He passed away when he was fifty-three, which is younger than I am now. Okay, um, and some of the people think that he passed away because of his involvement in the creation of the atomic bomb. So he was exposed to uh, radiation, and that's partially why he uh, did not live too long. Because if he were to if he were to live longer, I think he would have even made even more uh, contributions to many fields. So the next question now is, what is his contribution in computer science? Why is he important in addition to Alan Turing and some of the other people who were important? So what I want to do is to show you a picture of the Colossus uh, computer. Colossus. There we go. From 1943. And there we go. So you want to magnify this picture a little bit. So you can see the computer is really quite complex. Okay, they use tape as a uh, way to store data. But the most important part of the Colossus is, is how a program is specified. In other words, how do we specify the behavior of this computer? What it does and how it gets the job done? It was all done by wiring, okay? It was all hardwired. So depending on how components are interconnected, um, that determines you know, what, the, what the computer is going to do. You know, where are you gonna get this data? What are you gonna do with that data? What kind of calculation are you car you're carrying uh, when you get the data? What do we do with the result of the calculation? All of those, were specified by physical wiring. So you can probably imagine what the wiring may look like, you know, behind the back of a computer like this. So I will show you a wire wrap computer. This is a, oh, not this one. This is a pretty good representation of what a wire wrapped computer may look like. Which this is just a small portion of a the back of a computer that was wire wrapped. Okay? And this is already using transistors and semiconductors. The Colossus, I believe, was using uh, vacuum tubes, which means you know, the components were huge compared to what we see here. So every post, everything that is sticking out here is called a post. And then the posts are pretty tall. The wires um, have a strip end that's about an inch long. So the way you make a connection between two posts is to put the wire into a wire wrapping tool, 
you put the wire wrapping tool into the post and then you turn it. Okay, and that will wrap the exposed or the non-insulated end of the wire around the post, making an electrical connection. Then you take the other end of the same wire to the post that it's supposed to connect to, connect to and do exactly the same thing. Okay, so in this case, you can see how the wires are overlapping, flying over each other, and do all kinds of crazy stuff like that. That's very typical of a computer because the interconnection between the components is not going to look very nice when you look at just the connections. So imagine that this is how a computer, how you specify the behavior of a computer, how it gets computation done. And somebody comes along and goes like, you know, we don't like this calculation anymore. I want you to incorporate this additional part, you know, this equation here. What do you have to do? You have to undo a whole lot of the wiring and then redo a whole bunch of wiring, you know, to try to get it to work. What if it doesn't work? There's no debugger, there's no GDB, Okay, there's no operating system. You really just have to try to figure it out. Okay, and you can, I mean, there's no such thing as updating my app. I mean, because you, we are so used to having, you know, uh, how is it called? Update or update by, by air? Over Can the I, air. Huh? Over the air. Over the air, okay. So the whole concept of oh, you need to update the operating system using a floppy disk, is foreign to all of us already. This is much worse than that, okay? So the one contribution that von Neumann made in this respect was simply saying, you know, these computers have memories, right? Yeah, they do have memory because you need memory to store the numbers that are being crunched, okay? The, the equations that are being evaluated. So von Neumann's you know, suggestion was simple. Can we use that memory also to store instructions? And then the instructions being stored in memory will tell the computer what to do. That is going to specify the behavior of the computer. That was his contribution, which to you and I doesn't sound like a whole lot, right? Because if we are so used to it. But back in his days, in order not to do this and switch to having the instructions stored in memory was a big deal. So that was his contribution. I know by our standard, it, didn't, it doesn't seem like much, but without that concept, without that idea of storing instructions in memory, instead of hardwiring everything, you know, computers would not get to where it is now. All right, so that's kind of the context. So the next question is, so how does a computer remember something? How does memory work in the case of a computer? So that's when we switch to the tablet so that I can give you pictures. All right, so I have to switch this back. Okay, not that. Yeah, there we go. So I pull control over, making a new page, that sort of thing. So I'm gonna introduce a circuit that is made out of components that you should be somewhat familiar with but you may not see this configure. You may not have seen this configuration before, so we'll go like this. Okay. We have uh, two input pins like that, two output pins like that. This goes here. This goes here. This one goes to one of the input pins. This one goes to one of the input pins. We tap here, and then we go here. We tap here, and then we go here. Okay. That's the, that's the circuit, okay? So this is the first time ever that we see a circuit that has quote unquote a loop or a feedback of some kind. Because all of the circuits, even the complex, you know, carry look ahead circuits that we did before, yes, it is kind of complex. Wires are going everywhere, but they're always going in one direction. They, they, they start, we start with the input pins, it goes to, they, they go into the input side of the gate, the output of that gate goes to the input of another gate, and so on, but they only go in one direction, and then eventually they get to the output pins. This is the first time that we see something that is not like that, okay? So the question is, how does this work, okay? So before we go there, we, we're gonna label the pins a little bit. Okay, so the input pins are labeled S and R, the output pins are labeled Q and NQ. NQ stands for not Q. And then we have the two NAND gates, one is N1 and the other one is N2. 
So that's basically a circuit uh, that we're going to analyze. So what we'll do is we're going to go through a few scenarios. The first scenario is what if, so we want to track what's going to happen to all of these pins. S and R are the two input pins, so we can only change the input pins. The output pins is the result of whatever the circuit is supposed to do. So we're going to ask a question of what if S and R are both zeros? What do you think is going to be Q and N Q of the entire circuit? We know nothing about the state of the transit of the uh, NAND gates prior to this time, but as soon as we change both of the input pins to zeros, what do you think is going to happen to the output pins? And these are NAND gates. They are negated AND gates. They'll be ones. Very good. Okay. So both outputs would be ones in this case, and why do we know they should be ones? Exactly, because of negative and and the truth table, because with an and, which is a conjunction, if at least one side is a zero, the output is going to be a zero for and, but since a negative and negates the output, the zero becomes a one. Okay, so very good. That's exactly why or how we determine the output would become like this. Okay, very good. So the next one is, what if we change one of the input pins, let's say S here, and we change it to a one? So R remains to be zero, what's going to happen now? Now this gets a little bit more involved, right? Because what we need to do now is to keep track of you know, what is happening in the previous state. In other words, if I were to use a different color, and I'm going to use this color here, this, vi this is violet, okay, cool. So if I were to use the color violet to indicate what each node has, so this node has a one, this node has a one, this node has a zero, this node has a zero. That's you know, referring to the first row here, okay? So when we switch to the second row, uh, what got changed? S is changed first, okay? So what we do is, okay, I'm gonna use a different color. Let's say orange. So we now say, what is the first change? The first change is this got changed to a one. Is that okay? So the question now is, um, how is that gonna change anything? What is the next component that I should analyze? Because the input pin has got changed to a one. We only got two gates here. So the, what is the next one that I should analyze? And one, exactly, because N2 is not seeing any changes yet. But one, at least one of the input of M1 is now changed. So that means we have to re-examine M1 and ask, based on the current inputs, what is going to be its output? So what do you think? What should be the new, should N1 update its output because of the update to its input? It should become a zero, very good. Because right now at this point, let me use a mouse pointer to point out. Because one of the inputs is still the one coming out of N2, it's going to one of the inputs of N1. The other one is now a one going into the other input of N1. So that means N1 right now at this instant of time has both inputs being ones. Because it's a NAND gate, its output is gonna to update to a zero. Okay? But the analysis is not done yet. Because that zero, the one that we just updated, is going to go back to one of the inputs of N2, right? Because you can see how this wire connects the zero all the way back to this N2 here. So that means N2 used to have, used to have the top pin being a one, it is now a zero. Now fortunately in this case, it's not gonna update the output because the idea is if at least one input of the NAND gate becomes a zero, the output is gonna be a one. So what if both inputs are zeros? It still continues to be a one. So that is when we can stop the analysis and go like, oh, okay, we're done here. So now the, to summarize, we are going to specify the output in this case. And you can see how Q is becoming a zero and NQ remains to be a one. So it's basically like a step. 
uh, step. So we're gonna see what happens next, okay? So that's a good question, is what, it, what's gonna, what is it gonna do next? So the next one is, what if we are to flip R also from a zero to a one? That's the, that's the next step. So I'm gonna use yet another color here, and let me pick uh, blue, okay? So blue is the second to the last. My tablet is, doesn't have color, so I can only see the color when I see it on the monitor. All right, so blue is going to say, you know, what, did, what are we updating this time? We are now updating this zero to a one. So that means N2 needs to be analyzed because you know, this is one of the input into N2. Whenever a date has at least one of the input changed, we have to re-examine and say, okay, what should be the output at this time? So what do you think? What do you think should happen this now? Okay. This input of N2 connects to this node here, which is still a zero at this point of time. The other input of N2 is now a one, which means the input of N2 is now a zero one. So what should be the output of N1? N2, sorry. One of the two inputs is a zero, it's a NAND gate, so what should happen? The output is zero. no. It continues to be a one. So that means I don't have to say anything because it has been a one already. Okay, so the, the update change, you know, the update change, the update ends here. There are no further updates. Is that okay? So it looks like, okay, all right, so you know, it's not too bad. And if I were to complete the truth table, if we can call it that, it will remain the same as before. Is that okay? So now we do the opposite, okay? So we will basically do the same analysis, S, R, Q, N, Q. On the other side, start with zero, zero again. So when both input pins are zeros, the outputs are guaranteed to be one ones, okay? Quite regardless of what is used to be before, okay? Because if at least one input of the NAND gates are getting zeros. So instead of doing the entire analysis here, what I'll do is I'm just gonna point out the fact that this circuit is top-down symmetric. Does that make sense to you? If you were to look at the circuit and put a mirror right in the middle horizontally, it's the same, right? So that means the analysis that I need to do is gonna give me exactly the opposite, the mirror of what it used to be, okay? So that means, you know, um, SR would switch, Q and NQ would switch too. So that means, you know, oh, okay, that's not too bad. So that means if the inputs are like this, then the output is gonna look like that. And then the, when the inputs are finally like this, the output will remain like that. Are we good so far with this? So I just kind of cheated and say, you know, if you just kind of look at this circuit using its symmetry, then you know, we don't have to do the entire analysis again because it's just gonna be the mirror image of what we used to have. But if you, you know, want to, if you want to do it on your own, you can also go through the analysis exactly the same way, but with the new changes. But one thing is really interesting here. When both inputs are zero zeros, okay? Outputs are one one, not a problem. When the inputs are one zero, you know, then the output is zero one on one side. When the inputs are zero one on the other, you know, in a different configuration, the outputs are one zero on, in that configuration. Also not a problem, it doesn't cause a conflict, okay? What is interesting is, oh, if we transition to a one one from a one zero, as far as the inputs are concerned, it maintains the state of zero one. On the other hand, if we transition from the input state of zero one to one one, it would maintain the other state. Do you see how the circuit has some semblance, okay, of memory? It keeps the state when both inputs are one ones. Is that okay? All right? So is this your idea of you know, what memory should look like? No, probably not, okay? This is a really, really weird kind of memory device, but it is very simple. Think about it. 
how many transistors do I need to make one NAND2 gate? This is something that we talked about on day one of this class. So some of you may not have may not remember how many transistors do we have regardless of the type? Four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You raise your hand. I thought you were saying four, but yeah. okay. So four transistors. So this entire circuit only needs eight transistors, not a whole lot, and yet it has some semblance of being able to remember something. So this is the smallest uh, mechanism that we use in order to quote unquote remember something in a computer. Its name is really just a simple SR latch. What do you mean by S and what is, what, what do they mean? Are they the initial of some people? You know, nope. S stands for set and R stands for reset. That's all they mean. So you have a latch. You have one input pin that can set, which means you have two becomes a one. You have another input, which is R, which will reset the value of Q, which means you're turning it into a zero. And Q is really just a freebie thing. You know, in, in, in other words, most of the time, we don't really care about NQ. NQ is just a freebie that we end up with regardless because N2 has to be here, configured in this particular way. So whether the output of N2 becomes its own output pin or not, it's kind of like, well, let's make it an output pin because it's a freebie. Are we okay so far? All right. So the next question, okay, is what if we switch the inputs from 0, 0 to 1, 1 simultaneously? We don't go through a 1, 0 or a 0, 1, okay? What is, what's going to happen in that case? Let me, let me write it down so that we can see what, what I mean by that, okay? So we still have the same thing. We still start with 0, 0, and then the output would still be 1, 1. The question is what if I change both S and R simultaneously from zero to one. Hmm. What do you think? Hmm? You're not wrong. <laughs> like my kids like to say to me, it's like, Dad, you're not wrong, which means you're not entirely right either. There's something missing, okay? So what is missing? So the only way to check this out is to do it step by step, okay? So let me go back and erase um, all the color you know, zeros and ones, and then we'll redo this circuit. Okay, let me go to the eraser tool. And it's a bit small. Yep, okay. So we'll go ahead and erase these two, erase those two, do -do, do -do, like that. Okay, very good. So now we're going to take a look at no, the zero, 0 is still going to do its job, okay? So we'll still be using one of the colors. We'll still be using purple. Come on, purple, purple. There we go. So we'll still use purple to indicate when both inputs are zeros, then the outputs will be ones and ones. Okay, that's still going to be the initial state. Okay, not a problem. You know, that part has not changed. So then the next question is, what if I change both inputs from zero zeros to one ones at the same time? So now we use a different color. We'll use orange in this case. And then we say, at the same time, this is now changed to a one. This is also now changed to a one. What's going to happen? So this time I have to reanalyze both N1 and N2 because each one has at least one of its input pins changed because of this transition. So right now, at this particular instance of time, what are the inputs of N1 in terms of zeros and ones? They're both, they're both ones. And N2, they're also both ones. Now, do you guys remember the, uh, the concept of a propagational delay? When the input of a gate changes, it takes a very small amount of time, typically measured in nanoseconds, before the output would change, right? So after a very short amount of time, after one PD, one propagational delay, the output would change. So that means, oh, the output is gonna change to a zero, and this output is gonna change to a zero as well. And you go like, wait, tech, but this means, you know, because they go back, right? You know, this output here, 
it goes back to N1, this output here, it goes back to N2. Doesn't that mean that we have to reanalyze N1 and N2? The answer is yes, we have to do that. So what do you think is the new update in this case? Okay, so this N1 is going to have this particular pin change to a zero. This N2 is going to have this particular input change to a zero. So what, what should be the new output of both NAND gates? Back to ones. Very good. Okay, so now we go... We use blue to do this update, the third update. So now we go like, wait, hold on a second here. You're not supposed to be a zero. You're supposed to be a one. And you're also not supposed to be a zero. You're supposed to be a one. But then we get, we started with this state earlier, right? So what's going to happen now? This one goes back to here. This N2 now ends up with one one. So its output is going to be a zero again. This, N, this other uh, NAND gate N1 is also getting both of its inputs being ones at this point, so its output is going to be zero again. So I'll do one more update like this, okay, you know, like right now. This is going to be red in color. So we say, oh, wait, hold on a second here. Uh, change it back to a zero. Change this back to a zero, and it's going to alternate. In other words, we end up with an oscillation. This is called an oscillation. The circuit basically has a feedback mechanism where it will indefinitely keep alternating between zeros and ones. So Q and NQ are both going to alternate between zeros and ones. It, is, it doesn't have a steady state anymore. The concept of a steady state is there will be no further changes to the state of the gates. This one, as it is right now, has no steady state because the output Q and NQ will basically just keep alternating between zeros and ones. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. <clears throat> so once again, this is the smallest memory device that you can build using your logic gates, or in this case, eight transistors. Four P-type transistors and four N-type transistors, that's all we need to build the smallest unit of a memory device in a computer. Is this really useful by itself? The answer is no, it's not really particularly useful. We have to build additional circuits on top of this in order to use to be to have something that is actually useful to us, but it forms the basis. More importantly, the way we analyze how the output of the gates change their state in this class is going to be useful because we're going to talk about those updates for the more complex circuits that we'll be introducing uh, next, no, in the next class, which is Wednesday. Are there any questions about what we have talked about today regarding the SR latch? Or the process of analyzing you know, the behavior of a circuit like this? Because this is the first time we see something where it's not just going in one direction. Something goes back so that we have to analyze the circuit, a circuit like this in a different way compared to all the other circuits that we have seen before. Okay, there are no questions. I do want to mention something that is not assembly language related. Um, how many people have used the chat GPT? Okay, sort of. I found that uh, it's really helpful, okay? I just, let's just say that I know someone um, who had to learn JavaScript and web scripting, you know, um, over like just two days you know, in a competitive environment. And that certain someone was able to use your know, chat GPT to both self-taught a little bit and use your know, chat GPT to actually come up with the code a little bit to actually get projects done. So that means, you know, from your perspective, okay, ChatGPT can be a really useful tool because it is interactive, for one. Two, it has a very rich library of knowledge. And three, it's pretty easy to work with, okay? You just ask it a question, it comes back with an answer, and so on. So it's really helpful in that way. But there's one thing you have to watch out for is not to over-rely on ChatGPT. 
Okay, so when you're doing your homework, you might be able to figure out certain things you know, using ChatGPT. You have a syntax error on a certain line. You have no idea why it's complaining. ChatGPT actually can help you find find out what problem it is. If you give it the source code, that error message will actually help you find out what the problem is. But if you over rely on ChatGPT as a student, what's going to happen? You, you, won't be, you won't be learning by yourself, right? So you'll be able to use the tool. You learn how to use the tool, but you may not learn the actual underlying concepts. So you graduate from ARC, and then you graduate from you know, a four-year university, and then you go out for a job interview. So what do you think they do in job interviews these days for developers? Hmm? They test you. They test you, exactly. So what do they test you with? That's the next question. Some of you probably know this already, but may not be the entire class. So the way they test you is to go to something, I mean, this is not going to be coming from the code itself, but they, they'll give you problems to solve. But, and you cannot use ChatGPT. You cannot just copy and paste the problem, paste into ChatGPT, and get the result and put it in as your answer, because somebody is going to watch you do it. And they want to make sure that you can do it, not ChatGPT. Because if all you do is to put in the prompt and get ChatGPT to get the answer back, then your interviewer is going to say, oh, I can do that too. There's no reason for me to hire you. Does that make sense? So use it as a tool. You can learn a lot of things using ChatGPT, even within just the context of you know, any type of STEM subject matter. But do not over rely on the tool. Okay, just make sure that you understand the concepts. Use it as a tutor. Okay, I think ChatGPT makes a great tutor because you can wake up 2 a.m. in the morning and go like, you know, I really don't understand that concept that Tech Talk talked about today. Let me go ask you know, ChatGPT. Don't call me at 2 a.m. Do not email me. Do not you know Discord me at 2 a.m. because I won't be responding. But guess what? ChatGPT will still be there, okay? You know, quickly and answering your questions, and if you need clarification, it understands the context of the conversation. So when you ask, so what is that concept? It knows how to answer that. So use it as a tutor, okay? I just want to bring this up because it's fresh in my memory, and I think it is a good topic to bring up in my classes. All right, so we are done for today's lecture. I will stay here as long as you guys stay here to work on your assignment that is due next Monday. I strongly advise your people to kind of maybe use this opportunity to get started so you can know, okay, is this the right way to use the online GDB? Is this how we set up a breakpoint and so on? Um, if not, you know, you're free to go. Um, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. So let me stop the recorder. Yep. I did not take a look today, which is fine.